Hello there, my name is Graham Fitch and welcome to December's Practicing Clinic. Um, we do this every month where I sit here at my piano and answer questions that the Online Academy subscribers have sent in. Um, and hopefully I'll give you some things to think about. Um, the idea here is that we direct the questions you know, with regard to practicing rather than technique as such, but of course, uh, practicing and technique are, are one and the same. So, um, you know, it's, it's really all embracing here. So, you know, welcome to this clinic. If you've not joined me before, it's probably about 40 minutes. Um, we put it on YouTube afterwards. Do let me know where you're coming from. Um, I see that I've got an opportunity to share this with another group, which I've now done. And all sorts of things pop up on my screen, including uh, people who are watching. So if you are watching me, please, Lynn, hello, Lynn and Bob, nice to see you. Uh, let me know where you're um, watching from. And don't forget to hit all those buttons that to do hearts and flowers and all that. But let me go straight. CK, hi there, CK. Uh, and Ryan, yes. Oh, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for those hearts that kind of float up the screen. Uh, that lets me know, pretty hi there. It lets me know people are there actually watching that I'm not um, talking to myself. Amina, nice to see you. Let me go now straight to the first question from Julie, who says, I'm really struggling with a section from Bartok's first rondo from three rondos on folk tunes from bars 111 to 118. I like it when people are specific like this. <laughs> Um, no matter what I do, I cannot seem to coordinate the two hands together in any reliable way and would be grateful for any suggestions you may have for practice. Yes, now the, this Bartok Rondo happens to be uh, set for the ABRSM grade 8 for, for this year. And the section that Julie is talking about, uh, let me just show you what it is in slow motion. <laughs> see what's going on we've got the folk tune on the top of the right hand and this is how I would first suggest practicing it just extract that top line using the fingers that you will be using when you play all of the notes because underneath we've got some chords which I'll look at with you in a second but let's start off just by taking the top melodic line and what I'm doing is I'm enjoying the release from the staccato eighth note quaver I'm really making sure to use the fingers that I'm going to end up with. Five, four. Now, I don't know if you can see how joyous my releases are there. <laughs> That's a feeling. How can you see a feeling? But up. So when I, when I play my D, my pinky here, I kick against my keyboard and release upwards. That means that I can land on the next note really freely, um, wherever it may be. If I wanted to play that an octave higher or an octave lower, I could because my release has been so good. So that would be the first thing. Five, four, five, four, five. And when I'm really comfortable with that, I'm, I'm going to have a little look and see what's on the underneath. Now I've got triads. And again, I, I need to kick up against the, the keyboard. Now, if you wanted to take another step, you could dissect those triads and play just the upper note. Uh, so instead of playing the two notes underneath, I'm missing out the thumb. I'm playing the, the melody note plus the first um, triad note underneath or the first chordal note underneath. Hi there. We've got people from all over the place watching. It's nice to see you all. And then maybe I could play my melody line again, with this time with my thumb only. That's a very good practice technique, just to deconstruct. Then when I put it together, you see how my 
my hands releasing. Now, if I wanted to take a, a, another step, supposing I wasn't quite ready to do that, I could actually block this. So instead of playing that, I could play block, block, hand positions. Get the idea? Now in the left hand, let's look and see how the left hand interacts. We've got an accettatura um, with this idea of hopping from one octave to the other. Now, there's an issue with that because if we try to play baronk with our left hand, we may be uh, we may get sluggish. So there's a very good way of doing this where you can play the grace note together with the main note, and this works very well with rhythmic accettaturas. Uh, especially if they're fairly fast, which these are, and fairly short. So what I'm doing is I'm playing both notes together, but voicing to my second finger, which just means my second finger is a, a little bit firmer than my uh, third finger. So then if I added those blocks to the right hand blocks, and do you see how fast I'm moving from one block to the next? positions, hop, and wait on the keyboard. So that, that would be a very good thing to do for practice. Now, um, I've got so many different ideas for practice. If you really want to check that you are releasing nicely here, you could do something I call octave displacements. Do you notice what I'm doing there? Veronique, lovely to see you, and Lynn, um, terrific. So, did you notice what I did? Instead of playing here, I jumped the octave too high. And if I really want to have a bit of fun with it. Whoops, I meant that. Now, you, you, you may ask, well, what's the point of that? That's making it much more difficult. Well, that is part of the point. And part of the point there is, if I can do that, then surely I can do that. But because it's next door, this chord here is next door, there's a kind of temptation to try and join it, and that will cause tension in the hand. So release upwards. And there are loads of other things I could share with you here. Chaining is a very good one. Just do two groups. And then, what am I doing here? Just a bar with a stop. Stop and recover. See how you could do that, then you could add another bar to that and make groups of, of two bars. So I hope that gives you a few ideas for this. Um, Estella, how do you handle something that you suspect has a wrong note? Um, I am having that issue with one note written on my photocopy of Debussy's Claire de Lune. The piece starts in D flat major, but in measure six, the very last chord in that measure on my copy, uh, states I should play A flat left hand chord. This doesn't sound right to my ears. It sounds much better with an A natural there, which is right. What sounds right or what is written on the manuscript? Well, I think you, there's several points here that one of which uh, causes me a little bit of an alarm bell, if I'm to be honest with you, Estella, uh, a photocopy. <laughs> uh, why not just get, you know, if, if you think about the number of hours that you're going to be spending with this piece over the years, why not just get yourself a proper copy? Um, you know, don't don't rely on something that you've downloaded from the internet, which has all sorts of mistakes written on it. It, it is actually an A natural. That the the spot you're looking at is is uh, absolutely an A natural. But bar six here, let me know uh, where's the first place to start from. A natural, and then an A flat. this piece uh, describes this moon, the moon that uh, starts high and then it starts to come down gradually. That's bar four, bar five, it's coming down even further. Here's your bar six, A natural, A flat in the next bar and, and it takes a full nine, nine bars well, eight, eight bars, to get from that high point to the low point. And the way that he does that um, is by blurring the, the boundaries between the left hand and the right hand. So they don't move together. You'd expect maybe something like this. I haven't planned to talk about this. 
but the left hand first so you get the suspension at the top now the left hand moves but the right hand stays duplet duplets there so you've got to figure out a really good fingering here that allows the right hand to connect and that would mean some substitutions um, pitfalls in this piece of course of the triplet versus the duplet uh, patterns particularly since the duplets are tied which adds further complication to the to the to the rhythmic organization so you know if you're learning this piece the beginning looks very simple but it's actually not so not so simple um Cletus and Chris hi there but to get back to the question I happen to not like photocopies um, of anything because not not only does it deprive the publisher and, and the composer of their due royalties but it's also really scruffy to work from and some of the stuff that you can get on the internet is actually not terribly good it's loaded with mistakes so get yourself a reliable edition I happen to have here the, 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 from my student days the the United Music Publishers score you can get or text scores the Henler or text or the Berenreiter or text or the Vienna or text are the three elite or text editions um, but you know you which is not to say you can't use other editions as supplements I, I'm a particular I'm really fond of the Harold Bauer Schumann editions in Schirmer but they are uh, he, he's he's kind of tampered with the, with the the notes there he's done his own thing but if you've got an Ortex score and you've got the Harold Bauer uh, Schirmer edition you can get some fantastic ideas from the Bauer and then you just look back to the use the um, Henler or the Ortex as your working score um, but don't use photocopies don't use bad editions it's really important if you're playing the classics and I'm talking about the you know Haydn Mozart Beethoven not to use the old editions because they're so full of mistakes and personal uh, markings tamperings actually from the editor uh, Nicole and Kerry lovely lovely to see you and Annette so yes it's an A natural and please don't use photocopies you get something decent um, Christina has the Chopin Andante Spionato and how to make the left hand as soft as possible how to practice for that well okay it is marked uh, pianissimo do we all know the this is beautiful this music <laughs> As soft as possible, uh, I, I think is already making it hard for oneself psychologically because we're never going to be satisfied that it's soft enough. Um, I've often noticed this with pianissimo, and it's not helped by uh, clever teachers who, in master classes, uh, point out something like, um, "Have you spotted that this is pianissimo? You're not playing pianissimo. Stop. Try again." And the student is about to try again. And before they've even started, the teacher said, "It's already too loud." which is a kind of smart-ass comment that doesn't do any good to anybody because uh, obviously it's not too loud, there's no sound that's come out. All it will do is make you obsess that you can never play softly enough. You'll never be able to play softly enough to please that teacher or to please, the, uh, to please yourself. So one thing I'd say about that is, yes, of course it's got to be soft, um, but you know, it's all relative, isn't it? So if, if my right hand projection here, So I'm looking at a different fingering here. So my right hand needs to be firm enough. And if that's firm and singing in cantabile, then this underneath will, will uh, already be soft enough in relation to the right hand. But that's not nearly detailed enough an answer to your question there, Christina. Uh, the, there's a couple of things, the, several things I would say about it. One is, when I play my right hand, I'm really feeling like I'm connected into my key. I want to feel like I've, I'm right at the bottom of my key, almost squeezing the sound out, you know. Um, my elbow would be low, lower, and I'd be playing on the pad of my finger. I'd want to get as much contact finger with key and, and really to project that line. But in the left hand, 
I'd want the opposite. So I'd want to make my elbow a little bit higher and a little bit further up so that when I cross over here, I feel like I'm floating across the keyboard rather than if I'm lower like this. too much sound. So the legato indication is slightly misleading because actually I would want to feel and I would certainly want to practice a leggero finger to get that um, delicacy in the fingertips. So the fingertips need to be almost scratching the keyboard rather than digging into the key. So you may find that it, once you put your elbow a little bit further up and a little bit higher, you will find that the, this maneuver, the coming from the thumb to the three, that crossing, that pivot, um, would already feel more comfortable. So you might, in order to get the position, you might start by playing the thumb and the third finger together and just, just seeing where you are here. And then when you release the hand into the playing position, see there I don't have to, if I'm too far down here I have to make a jerk there and that's going to cause bumps and lumps and it's going to make me feel very uncomfortable so see if you can find a position which makes that maneuver really comfortable having said that having said that the way I would get into the B from the thumb is with a rotary movement rotational movement from the thumb to the third finger uh, I don't know if you can see that. Let me do that in super slow motion. So there's my thumb. And then when I go over my thumb, I rotate into my third finger. So the movement into the third finger is from right to left. And I would practice that with a, a, a practice method that those of you who know me will know this practice method. I call it target practice. So what I would do... and reliable that movement is so I'm feeling exactly the same release over my thumb to get into the third finger no matter where I go and I had this analogy the other day it's a little bit like you know when you when you flick something from a rubber band or you have a, a rubber band on your finger elastic band and then you let it go and there's a kind of spring uh, it's a very satisfying feeling you see how far you can get the rubber band well that's what it feels like to me here I'm not lifting up and I'm not actually trying to make too much of a legato connection there. So I appear to be contradicting myself. Um, I'm not actually. I would work both ways. So then a, a little exercise you could do. So I'm going further than I would need to go. Um, one last thought on that um, would be I'm, you, you will probably very clearly see the rotations here. Do you see the rotations there as well? So you might want to just experience, well, Chopin's already given, you, given us that experience at the end of the bar here, of, of the rotation from the G to the D. But let's see if we can generate a little exercise here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to label the notes. Um, I'm going to number them from one to six. So note one, two, three, four, five, six, one. Okay, now there's a method in, in this madness. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a sextuplet subdivision of notes one and two. And now note three and two. I made a little exercise where I put an accent on one and uh, two and uh, one and two. Now you can see why I'm doing that because I really want to free up my rotations. Now that rotation is counterintuitive until you've got it, in which case you will love the way it feels. That rotation there. 
notice that my thumb is rotating inwards toward my body in the opposite direction of the travel. And, and until you've got that, you're going to be struggling with it and it's going to feel really, I can't get this, I can't get it. But once you've got it, <laughs> it'll be with you forever. So let me just show you the rotations here. finger makes a rotation from the right to the left. There we go, that one you need to feel. So those are some ideas. Of course you can, oh, there's one other idea I really do want to share with you. Um, I can go in a little bit more detail this week because we've got slightly fewer questions. Maybe because it's holidays and people are not practicing. <laughs> but anyway, um, another idea that I find particularly helpful, and it goes for all the patterns in this, this I'm just choosing the first pattern. Um, which is to shift where the where you feel the first note of the group. So instead of counting or sort of feeling it one and two and three and one and two and three and one, two, three, four, five, six. What I'm going to do now is to feel six, one, two, three, four, five. So I'm shifting the stress. Second note, then I would work um, on, on the same principle. I would feel five, six, one. So five, six, one, two, three, four, 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 five, six, one, two, three, four. And then by the same token, that would get the stress. It's a very useful procedure to, to follow and of course some rhythm practice would be helpful for this as well for control Whoops. I'm doing this without pedal but I could do it with the pedal as well I'm doing it without the pedal because I find myself in these demonstrations sitting at a really weird angle. Um, I'm kind of facing here and, and using positions that if a student were to play like that, I'd put my hand up in horror and say, no, you have to sit around properly. Of course you have to sit around properly unless you're doing something like this. So if, during the lockdown, I've learned to use uh, my left foot is, is using the right pedal. <laughs> I've got into all sorts of horrible habits. Um, Gavin, one question for a performance grade eight exam. Would it be okay to choose lists of transcendental? Etude number three. Um, I don't think it's on the syllabus, is it there? Right, now let's move to the next question. Janet, I'm learning Schubert's, Schubert Liszt's Ave Maria. I'm having a difficult time as it is written on three staves and I have never played pieces written like this before. Janet goes on to say, it's a bit like tapping your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time, yes. The three parts at the end of bar four particularly. Any general advice on learning anything written like this would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Uh, well, okay, let's let's see. We, we probably know this, this piece. Certainly uh, musicians who are not pianists would know Schubert's original song. Um, and pianists would know this in the Liszt transcription where we've got the melody right in the middle of well, let's look at what's it, what the ingredients are, because the ingredients are very rich, a bit like a Christmas pudding. We've got here a melody in the middle, which is shared out between the two hands. So I would start off by just knowing that very clearly. See what I'm doing there? That's the very first thing I'd do. I would pick out that melodic line from the texture there, shape it beautifully. In other words, shape it like a singer would shape it. Then the next thing I might do, and this, I'm using deconstruction techniques here. The next thing I might do is to add my bass line to that. Uh, very light, wrong finger. Uh, now the left hand has to play those. The left hand plays this. complex enough uh, in terms of negotiation around the keyboard uh, to, to be really worth practicing quite a lot like that 
not only do we have to figure out which hand goes where, but we've also got to listen to the, to the balance that we're creating between the two hands. Now, okay, the third element, the accompanimental element, is shared between the two hands. And again, this would be so worth just taking by itself. And that in itself is not easy. Um, so there's a ton of, of, of information that Liszt has to give us, meaning that he can't give us that information on two staves. It's too much. So he has to use three staves. It doesn't mean to say we have to learn it with all of the notes together all at once. We can disassemble it, deconstruct it. Now, I, I wanted to give you a few more ideas for the, for the chords. Um, in themselves, they're not easy. I have to figure out exactly how to get from one micro position to the next. So here I need a double thumb. In other words, finger 11. One goes on the, in the crack there. So to, to get a little bit of uh, familiarity with those, um, with those chords, you could do this. You could play each chord twice. Gives you a real opportunity to feel the position. I saw a very interesting idea for, for an exercise in, and actually it was in a, a, jazz, a book of jazz exercises by somebody called Claire Fisher who had this idea, Claire being a guy, um, it doesn't sound like a guy's name, but it is a guy's name. So what he, he had some place there where he suggested playing each chord four times in the, on the first run through, and then three times, and then twice, and then finally just once. So if you really wanted to take this idea further, now let me show you that with just three. there when I do that let me do it twice now Move. I'm not locking my hand into that position I'm moving see the first chord the second chord there's movement there so do you see how I could then having having disassembled this I've now got the melody with its bass and I've got the accompaniment which is, is shared between the two hands how about I, I now play the melody um, with the accompaniment, but, but no bass. Very slowly to start with. Oh, that should have been with the other hands. This is hard. But that's a good idea for practice. if I were to play the melody and the bass but without uh, with the left hand chords but not the right hand so I've eliminated one further layer which is the right hand chord stream then I could do that the other way around I could play the melody with the um, without the left hand chords but with the right and uh, do you see what I'm, do what I'm doing here I'm just being very creative with how I'm layering up this this structure by deconstructing it and then reconstructing it and you know there's, there's so much you could do with this just to address your point there about the um, last beat of, of bar four it's it's nasty because we've got triplets against du duplets here <laughs> that one beat and then just break it down you could do some chaining practice here easy enough that's just the first event just add that next event the accompaniment until that's in in the body in other words till you don't have to think about it my body is doing that now automatically then when I feel that automation just add the next note on the 
chain. And I do that until that's automated before I add the next one. Um, do you see how that works? Ch that's chaining practice. Now, I'm doing note by note chaining. We can use the chaining technique for bars, bar by bar practice. We can also do it backwards, meaning we start with the last part of the chain and then work fan out backwards this way. Actually, I'm going the wrong direction, aren't I? Um, very complex piece, very difficult piece to play well. Now, Jacob, this is our final question. Jacob says, I'm teaching Ebers the little white donkey, which is set for grade seven ABRSM. But no matter what I do, my student cannot manage the left hand at the start lightly and evenly enough. And she also gets very tight in her arm. We've tried practicing in dotted rhythms, but it doesn't seem to have helped much. Can you please give me any suggestions? Uh, yes, I, I think I can. Uh, I have to have this score right behind me. Um, it, this is a charming, charming piece of Jacques Hibert. It describes a donkey. I think the donkey must be trotting. touch of pedal even even though the staccato marks there the, 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 we can we don't when we see staccatos it does not mean we can't use our pedal little touch of pedal there would warm that up and add a little touch of color but that wasn't the question um jacob's question was uh, we've yes okay the left hand start lightly enough we've tried practicing in dotted rhythms it doesn't seem to help much right the thing with with, with dotted rhythms is if you do them well they can be helpful if you if you wrong position or you're using your hand wrong they can actually cause more harm than good because they'll lock if your hand is already locked into this five finger position then I'm finding that it doesn't feel good in my body at all because I would want to move can you see the mobility in my hand there that feels really nice so what am I doing well first of all I'm sensing the the alignment over these these two fingers five and two and then my alignment shifts to one and two, and then I feel in even, even a different position for two and four. So the first thing you could do would just be to give it a, a sprightly, I'm enjoying that, I'm not blocking out, um, you know, crashing up down on the keyboard, I'm taking the dynamic pianissimo. And just sensing the, the adjustments in the position that I need. That's the first thing I would suggest doing. The other thing I would suggest doing is, is practicing it actually legato to start with. So that I can get the, get the, the sensations um, of, of joins in the hand. Now, if you do want to use a dotted rhythm, you could, you could actually practice it legato or staccato in the dotted rhythm. as I'm still moving I'm not doing that without motion um, and then the rhythm the other way around could be very useful provided that tata tata was preserved rhythmically um, all the way through so it's, there's no good doing you know one floppy one and then one crisp one they've all got to match exactly yeah papa 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 all sorts of other rhythms you could use. And what have I done now? Pa, 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 would be extremely valuable to do. Um, but I do want to give you an idea that I had and I actually included in the Online Academy uh, resources for this piece. So it happens we've, we've covered this piece in the Online Academy. Um, it, it's where we, we add, let me just see if I can explain this, it's kind of difficult to explain, but if you could imagine that this were going on, in your imagination you're imagining that, and you just join in with maybe this little kind of subtext, which just means I play the F sharp, G sharp, F sharp, so this is how it would feel. 
remember I'm not actually playing that right hand, that's just what we're hearing. And then from there, I'm going to add stuff to that. And repeat that until that's in the body. And then... See what I did there? I just missed out some notes, but I gave a very clear, very strong rhythmical framework. Here's another one. Now. That gives me just the second beat. But the rhythm is very alive in my body. And it's, a, it's an ideal opportunity to use a metronome. If you wanted to use a metronome for this, that would be helpful. What's the next one? fan of transposition. What would it feel like to do that on the um, white keys? So just one final thought for that would be to practice with a, a pizzicato fingertip, which is where we pluck the key. No, let me go back into the right key, for goodness sake. <laughs> Tip is on the key. This is very Russian. This is Russian 101. Fingertip on the key and we pluck the finger into the palm but immediately we recover so there's, we don't stay here. We pluck and come back and that develops real fast reflexes in the tip of the finger which, which of course needs to be firm. If my, if my fingertip isn't firm um, there's no way I'm going to be able to play. I'll be flopping around all over the keyboard, you know. I'd, I'd have holes in that sound. So fingertips have got to be firm, but I've got mobility going on in that, um, in my hand. I think that is the last question. Let me just see that. Uh, yes. Right, we've done it. We've covered the questions that were posed. Uh, I have covered the questions that were posed to me um, by my subscribers this month. So I, all that's left for me to do is to wish you happy holidays and keep sending the questions in. Um, there's going to be another clinic in January. And any problems you're having, practice-related problems you're having, if you're a subscriber to the Online Academy, do please uh, contact me through the channels. Um, what else to say? Yes, we've had two questions here that relate to the ABRSM um, syllabus which I was privileged to be a part of on the selection committee for the advanced grades. And what we have covered on the Online Academy, I've made several, well, a whole lot actually. I think it's nearly a hundred uh, walkthroughs, video walkthroughs of each piece, um, where I talk about style, interpretation, practice, technique. And I think the idea there is for that to be helpful for individual players who, who maybe not have a teacher and also for teachers who might want to um, just get a, a few few different ideas about these various uh, pieces that we've got going here. So yes, l I will now shut up and let you get on with your Christmas preparations or whatever it is you're doing. Thank you so much for, for joining me and I will see you in the new year. Bye-bye.